welcome to episode number 12 of the Game Out Talk podcast. Kit is my guest today and I'm happy to have you on my show, Kit. Hey, how are you? Hello. Yeah, I'm doing good. Thanks. Yeah. Happy to be so here and maybe... excited to chat. Yeah. Same goes for me. So maybe you could give the, uh, the listeners a short introduction of yourself. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Kit. I've, I grew up in the UK and I was kind of playing Counter-Strike and modding Morrowind and these things throughout teenage years, but never realized that games were a career path. Like I think a lot of my generation mm. of game artists, we didn't really see it as even an option. Uh, yeah. But in the end, lots of research and finding a right university course meant that I went to university to get a game art degree with the intention of learning okay. fundamentals of art, you know, like drawing, perspective, um, life drawing and, and observational skills. And then from there, yeah, I got a job at Danbuster in the UK. We finished home front and I moved over to Barcelona to work for Ubisoft Barcelona as a weapon artist. And now I'm working on Rainbow Six Siege still, but in a more of a strange capacity as a realization designer, um, where I design gadgets and try and make them happen from all perspectives. Um, yeah. Okay. So you, so you're not just, um, creating them in 3d, you're more of a, you, you're concepting them also. Yeah. So I'm, I'm in a very fortunate position for someone like me who loves doing lots of different things. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I've, I've actually worked a few times where I've just been doing video editing to do concept art for UI changes for characters and things like this, where we need to make a change and the game designers have a vision of what they want. And my job is to realize that, um, okay. provide everything that goes into making it happen. So like there is a new specialist coming in the next DLC and the specialist can like, um, see through walls for some something like that and he needs a gadget how could this be um yeah visualized? yeah it, that kind okay. of thing i i've mainly worked on reworks um i'm part of the balancing cell so we we get quite into the nitty-gritty game design uh the existing game design and how to affect that so i've, I've managed to get quite a intense view of game design as an artist you don't often get that um so that's mm -hmm. been quite a cool experience mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you, so you had more, more step in the game design directory because yeah, because of this new, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a bit of everything. As I said, like uh, I still do the 3d if, if it's needed. Um, I do mm -hmm. 2d concepts to prove the ideas to the, the art directors. Um, I'll do a video editing. We have a character called Jackal who has a heads up display, which can show footprints in the world of the enemy team and we needed to change the way the user experience worked and that like the ui worked and so i did some video editing for that and it was like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no 3d no concept art really it was just kind of a bit of weird ui and video <laughs> so well, this is yeah. pretty interesting because i think you you don't often have the case that you like come or are between two really different departments in a game development studio. Yeah. It's, like it is in your side now. It's, it's definitely a unique position. I think I'm not, I'm not certain, uh, but it's, a, it's a position where it's not quite concept art. It's not quite 3d. It's definitely not entirely game art. Um, but my background as being an artist heavily working in engine and also a player of the rainbow um, meant that it, it kind of fitted together. So I, I had artistic, technical and game knowledge that I could kind of piece together and help mm -hmm. these, these guys out. Um, and yeah, I originally was working as a weapon artist here and I wanted to stay on the project and we stopped making as many new weapons at some point. And so I had a, an option of leave Rainbow Six and move on to a different project or take on this strange new world and discover oh, what realization is. Um, so yeah. 
Okay, so last week we had a short chat about art tests. So yeah. uh, let me hear your experience because as an artist, this is this is something that is pretty common nowadays that there is an art test for for mm. a new uh, candidate to get the yeah to get to, to like see the skills if the if the skill matches the company and yeah maybe you how is your experience with art tests and what okay. what could go what what goes wrong what could go better yeah yeah okay i have actually more experience of art tests from the recruiting side um okay in, good to know yeah in barcelona when i joined the studio was about 50 50 people and it's now uh, over 150 i think so at that time uh the art team was about five people um maybe a bit more maybe a couple more but less than 10. um and so we were ramping up to get more weapon art specialists for rainbow six and yeah i went through quite a bit of a process of trying to find the right people and hire the right people so i also then helped out later on when we were hiring people for a couple of other projects um, with trying to set our tests and setting our tests is so difficult. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. In general, our, our tests are a pretty tricky topic in the industry right now. And definitely the, the conversations online can be very anti art test and I completely understand why um, and it's very easy to make mistakes with art tests and set too much or just do it because you that you're not really setting a goal with why you're testing these people you know so from a person making the test perspective setting an art test isn't an easy feat it's there's a reason that some studios have art tests that stay the same um, and they don't want them to be shared online and everything because regularly it, a lot of work goes into that. And if people can see the art test online, then they can kind of get practice on it. But at the same time, that's, that doesn't really matter to me. I think the Star Citizen example is, is very clear. Everyone has seen that Star Citizen art test and I, like anyone could have a crack at that. You don't need yeah, to have applied. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that that's an intense art test. That's that's quite a lot. Um, and when you're asking someone to do that much, you have to give them the right amount of time. You have to assume that they have other responsibilities. Um, often art tests can advantage people who don't have don't have to work at that time or who can take like a week and just focus entirely on one thing yeah just grind so, it in mm. yeah i'm not really sure how i feel about them from that perspective anymore when i was getting into the industry it was kind of unexpected um i only had one that i took and that was for Dan Buster, and that was that was an intense experience. Like I was, mm -hmm. I was finishing off my final project at uni. I was working way too much anyway, um, and would really not recommend anyone to work the amount that I was doing, the number of hours in a day. Um, and I yeah, a bit of that kind of glorification of overwork was happening. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they sent me this art test and. They asked me to do it instead of in a week, in a couple of days, so that um, like I don't need to finish all of it, but you know, just do as much as I could in a couple of days. And so, being in that mindset of glorifying overwork, I just didn't sleep yeah. for a couple of days. Um, and when I look back on that, like I wouldn't have been able to do that if I was in a different social situation Life like situation I, yeah yeah if i had yeah. finished uni and i was having to like i sacrificed doing some uni work and spending some time with friends to do it like that's not that's not a problem but if i'd have had to take a day off work to 
to do this because I need to make rent at the end of the month. All these kind of things. Like, yeah, it's tricky. And I'm not sure what they really learned from that art test. And the same is true of some of the art tests that I was on the receiving end of seeing. It's like, what did we learn from this? Mm-hmm. There, there is definitely somewhere we learned a lot and, and we're like, okay, cool. This person is way better than their portfolio shows. Maybe they've got some work they can't show because of NDAs. Maybe they've got, you know, but th- th- this shows that they are capable, yeah. <laughs> which is, yeah. that's the point of it. So they do work in sometimes, but it's tricky. Uh, and, and setting them, I know that you had an experience where you had a lot to, to do on an art test and you were, you, yeah, you didn't, didn't enjoy it to say the least <laughs> from what you said yeah. last week. Um, yeah, I didn't enjoy it. And it was like the, 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 the pressure is so high on you that you got to perform, you got to show what you can do. And yeah. I think it's, it's becoming a weird situation for, for the hiring process. Like, um, yeah, yeah. It's just, um, it's, it's just some, some, um, not just physical hard, it's also psychological, pretty hard to get, yeah, to get it yeah. done. Yeah. yeah. And, and this is a competitive industry. So we have this problem where if you, we say, um, like as an industry, we should stop doing our test that, that becomes quite a difficult thing to say yeah. because like, this is a skill. Theoretically, this is a skill-based industry. There's, there's a lot of questions around yeah, that definitely, in terms yeah. of knowing the right people and stuff, but this is a skill-based industry. And so assessment of skill is difficult, but also assessment of personality comes in and, and the ability to work with the others. And it becomes this very difficult topic to talk about. Um, it's not, not an easy one. There's no right answer in my mind. It's yeah maybe it's it's more of a discussion that needs to be had between the interviewer and the interviewee of hey so we've looked at your portfolio and maybe you're you don't have as much of this type of work is there something you can show us that will help um or maybe you you could do a, a short test and then there comes the question of would that be paid and you know would the time be and those questions I don't really have an answer for. Um, a lot of more involved people and more experienced people have talked about it in the past. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I definitely had one experience where I was I applied to a position and it turned out that they were looking for someone to be able to do more vehicle stuff alongside weapon stuff. And I had experience mm-hmm. in making vehicles and. Um, I just don't have any in my portfolio because I didn't make an entire one and they were all done during production and something that I'm now feeling like, uh, yeah, my portfolio lacks that type of hard surface. And they said, Hey, do you have anything that you could show us? Or would you mind taking an art test? And at that time I was, I was here in Barcelona working for UB on rainbow and yeah, I was, you know, interested in change, but I wasn't committed to it. So I decided to just say no to the art test and that's and then we just left it there like the discussion yeah. went no further and um we went no like, no more talking about working together basically um so saying no to an art test can be tricky <laughs> it can be tricky i i had the experience um at a company they were looking for a weapon artist and i was like yeah yeah i can i'm, I'm interested and then they gave me an artist and the artist was like, build an environment in Unreal. And really? I was, I was, I was young, dumb and broke and I needed the job. I was like, okay, I can, I'm not that really into Unreal. Maybe I've heard of it and, and I know how to, to how to load in assets. And yeah, I didn't get the job because the, the work of, of uh, Unreal or, or the environment yeah. wasn't good enough, but <laughs> I think it's the, it's the, that that the comes baddest approach an artist can be, right? Yeah, that comes down to the the strangeness of setting an art test. Um, I know that one of the art tests I was asked to set, they asked to have, you know, it's for a kind of 
character asset artist. So it's needs to have some soft surface fabric, some hard surface stuff, it needs to be within this kind of tray count. It needs to have these kind of texture, but it, it, it had so many limitations on what was needed that finding something that was manageable um, within the time frame they wanted as well, it was, it was pretty tricky. And I have to say, like, I don't think I did very well on setting that art test, but we kind of knew that it was quite a challenge. And so, I don't know, if I was to do that again, I would do it differently, you know, um, but we, I think we, we learned things from the art test of like, okay, so third person versus first person characters and assets, there's a significant difference in try count in fidelity, um, these kind of things. So will that person understand that and will that person allot the right time for the right things but at the same time yeah as i say i think i would do it differently if i was to do it to be involved in that process again so would you say that artists are sometimes constructed to be not like achievable in this in the given time like <sighs> it i don't it think it's the intent. The, it, Okay. I don't think it's the intent. I think if, if someone's making an art test, they are intending that you you are comfortable. Like, I don't think anyone goes and uh, kind of does those annoying interview questions that you hear of sometimes of like, that, that try to trick you up. I, I don't I don't really believe that there are studios with people cutthroat enough to try and make you uncomfortable just to make you uncomfortable. Um, but I do think sometimes if an art test is, is in, looks intense from the concept and, and you're, you think, oof, I'm not sure how much of that I can get done. Um, it can be very intimidating to say, hey, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to finish all of this in that time frame, because you assume that the art test is being given with this perspective of all of this should be achievable in this time. And it's like, that is the ideal situation, but often hiring processes are messier than we believe. It's why often you, you send off an email uh, for a job and you don't hear anything for quite a few weeks. It's like, there's a lot of other stuff happening um, and professionalism of responding to like recruitment emails is important, but at the same time, like, it, it, it's, it's a weighing game and I think the people applying need to understand that while when, when you're looking upwards and you're looking up to the studio and that's where you want to go, they're in a position of power over you and it's in some way that can often seem like, oh, they've got everything sorted out and perfect. You know, like everything mm -hmm. there is mm -hmm. going smoothly. There's no problems. They have this process perfected, but behind the scenes it's it's normally that actually things are very messy things are very busy um and like people want to be in that way where they've got a really nice pipeline worked out for it but that that's a that's a rarity um yeah i would say that it's more rare to have a nice clean organized pipeline where everything is known <laughs> that's that's more yeah. rare than it is to have like a bit of a oh uh shit uh, can you maybe do this art test in a couple of days like maybe you don't need to do all of it but you know just give us an idea of it and then come back to us and it's like yeah that's that's something that i experienced with the dam buster thing you know i was given two days to do an art test that normally they would give people two weeks to do. And they were like, don't worry about doing everything, just do some bits and pieces of it. And I was like, do what you can do. In this exactly. Time. And I was like, I came out ad up being comforted by the fact that they were said, do what you can do within that time and everything. But if I was in maybe a different position, or if I had had different experiences with, with uh, game studios, I maybe would have thought, no, I need to finish everything. Otherwise I will fail it. 
Um, so yeah, it's it's a big topic, and I don't think I'm as equipped as some other people to discuss it. <laughs> yeah. Like I just think I but it's... have some of these glimpses for people who are maybe going to be doing the art tests to understand that things are not quite as they seem. So you would you would also say that an art test is necessary because, as you said, it's a skill based. Um, mm. Yeah. Necessary is a difficult industry. Difficult thing to say because, uh, like, your portfolio theoretically should show what you're capable of, and and I think giving someone an art test needs to be like there needs to be a reason you're giving them the art test. You know, like, hey, we we've looked at your portfolio. Most things look really really good, but maybe there's one thing that we'd like to see more of. Can you can you show us? Like, if if you're giving an environment artist an environment to do, which looks pretty much the same as their other environments. Like, why are you giving them the test? You know? Yeah. Um, so, but if, for example, from a weapon art perspective, if someone had like a bunch of kind of World War II era weapons with lots of wood and blued steel, and I needed them to make sci-fi guns, maybe I would say, hey, We've got this, I don't know, this grip that is pretty different stylings to what you're making here. Can you just spend a couple of days and show us that you have a clear grasp of polymer, of uh, machined metals, um, like fresh new things instead of these old, worn, beaten up objects? Yeah. Uh, that's where I would understand an art test being given, but as I said, it's not a not a simple one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I've seen you have some uh, 2D art and also some 3D printing on your portfolio. So <laughs> how is this hobby coming along with your with your with your career, and how can it be? How, how can your art in the career be fueled by the hobbies? So. Maybe you can give us a short, or maybe a long, a long um, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah, you know, I, experience of that. I kind of feel like a lot of the people who get into what we're doing, we love to make things, um, and whether that be experiences, stories, like physical, tangible things, like all of these different things, that creation is is why we're here. Um, And 3D to me is a tool, you know, it's, it's not about, um, 3D isn't, isn't the only thing in my life. Like, uh, I, I like making full stop, like it can be anything. Uh, I've been enjoying playing around with video. Um, and uh, as you said, yeah, I've made a bunch of 3D printed stuff. I made a cosplay of uh, vigil from rainbow six and went to a couple of events in cosplay um like we all draw like i i i mean i know there are some people who say they don't they don't draw but i think everyone has an understanding of using lines or shapes to um communicate and and that's basically what making in some way is it's a form of communication so to me it, it was kind of natural like Of course, when I was trying to get a job and then I was trying to get my like specialism within weapon art and hard surface stuff, I was super focused on 3D. But once I had that a bit more comfortable and I was like, okay, and I kind of know what I'm doing, that goes up and down every day. But like <laughs> sometimes it feels like I know what I'm doing. Then I wanted to explore the other things that got me excited. So. Uh, I did a, a course with Mikkel Kuss on CGMA, and that was like uh, drawing, um, I think it was something like drawing for hardware design or concept for hardware design. And that's where a couple of the, the vehicles came from. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I just think that I w if I'm going to have a portfolio, it, it's kind of part of, it's showing what I am capable of. And my career is game art, so that should be the primary thing. But on top of that, like, 
I enjoy making the other, these other things and I want to show them to the world. Like <laughs> nothing more, nothing less. Just I wanted to put it out there, these and... things and put it out there, yeah. you know, and, and when it comes back to it, like taking photos of the 3d printed props and taking fo photos inside Marmoset of the weapons, like I don't really see much difference, you know, it's yeah. I you're using you. composition, you're using the reflectiveness of the materials to sell different things. Texturing is just painting, but digital. Um, like telling a story I find really cool and fun within 3D because you have complete control, basically. Um, and it's something that I would like to feel that one day I can do with the 3D printed stuff, but um I'm not sure whether that's going to be my focus for the so, next year. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's speak about the texturing. Would you say that like with the hand painting and um your 3D printing mm -hmm. that the texturing also improved in like Substance Painter? I would or actually did you approach say the opposite way around. Um, really? Yeah, like when so i've always loved making stuff and i've done it like in in the uk we have dt design technology and i was basically i would always be between the art the artist area or the dt space and working in wood and plastics and metals and stuff so that's always been there but i was quite clumsy physically and i still kind of am um but what 3D gives you is the ability to have, as I said, complete control. And so when it comes to painting, good enough is the way I would phrase my way of painting physical objects. And then when it comes to texturing, like I'm getting, I try and get to the nitty gritty. Now, if I look back at some of the stuff I've done, like there are mistakes, of course, but in my blog posts, I've kind of, outlined some of the thought process I go through when doing the texturing stuff. And that comes down to thinking like, how is this used? Um, what is the material makeup of this thing? So because you have complete control in Substance Painter, you can put like, okay, base metal. And then on top of that, you can put a bit of oxidized, um, if we're talking aluminium, you've got the base aluminium, oxidized aluminium. On top of that, maybe you have a layer of paint. On top of that, you have another layer of different colored paint. On top of that, you have some, some dirt and grime. And on top of that, you have some grease, right? Like you've got this layer stack. And if you set it up right, you can emulate what happens in the real world by removing um, from the top down or adding from the, from the bottom up, but that layer stack gives you this really nice representation of what everyone sees in the real, real world around them. When they look at a, a scratched up paint box, they, they see that there's these different layers and then eventually the base metal. And then if you scratch that oxidized base metal, there'll be an even shinier, cleaner metal. Now doing that with a paintbrush, <laughs> is a bit <laughs> difficult, right? <laughs> like, uh, yeah, yeah. There are definitely people who can do it, uh, like Weta and ILM kind of springs to mind. Those guys are, you know, like those, those people working in those spaces are doing amazing paint jobs. But even then on film, like I was really let down when I saw some of Weta's uh, props. Like there was a um, RPF, the replica prop forum. They had a, um, uh, an auction for a bunch of the stuff from Spectre, the Netflix film about, mm -hmm. yeah, like the only reason I watched that was because of the designs, but it was fun, yeah. you know, it was an action movie. Um, but yeah, like when you look at those things up close, the paint job is good enough and then move on. But on games, like, you see this thing way closer than you ever see something in film and yeah, like first under person. much more scrutiny, you know, it's not one second clip. <laughs> it's a yeah. 30 hours or, or more. 
so yeah like they, they tie into each other but i actually experienced that my understanding of modeling and texturing came back into my ability to make physically and my observations of uh modeling from reference like if i look at the way that i model guns or, or, or the um, environment props like i would get super focused on details and those details would come back and help me with making the 3d printed props because i would put things like plastics have a certain um, injection molding line and i'd put that in my digital 3d stuff and then i'd also try and emulate it in some way in the um in the replicas in the, the studio printed stuff so yeah it kind of all kind of it's the same thing it's just a different medium uh is the way i would think about it and okay. with 2d it's the same <laughs> it's like 2d and 3d they fit together super well um you're thinking similar logics but design comes more important in 2d so um do, do you or have you been drawing um before starting with 3d or is this just something that came new to your to your craft no no i've been yeah like not well <laughs> but not i have well. been mm -hmm. i've been drawing for a, like since since i can remember it's like i, I would I think I'd use art as a bit of an escapism and, uh, yeah, drawing okay. forever basically. And when I went to De Montfort to do my university degree in game art, I was going with the vision of learning to draw at a technical proficient level, you know, like learning perspective and doing practicing life drawing and anatomy and these kind of things with the vision of being an illustrator or painter or these kind of these other fields. And the fact that I had knowledge of how 3D stuff worked just meant that the course was was really cool. And on the course, I realized, no, like game art stuff is awesome. <laughs> it's super fun. <laughs> um, it uses my technical knowledge and my love of like yeah the more technical side of things as well as the artistic it it, it covers both and yeah nice nice so let's speak about uh, weapons and props again yeah. do you want to focus in the future more on props or on weapons or does this go like hand in hand where where just it, yeah. there is no real difference you know but how how are you thinking about that I know that everyone has a bit of a different perspective on this. Um, I personally am not like a super weapon focused person. Um, I like making the thing that is the most detailed and in an FPS game, the gun is your tool, the, the, the weapon or gadget that you're, that you have in your hands while running around this map and interacting in this these set of rules that have been made by the game designers, your way of engaging with that game is the, the weapon or the gadget. And to me, that could be anything. Like uh, it could be, it could be a, a wooden stick, or it could be um, this one of these standard kind of assault rifles, or like it could be a sci-fi gun. It could be like Destiny, where it's they look almost like they're designed like. Um, as bespoke pieces of art rather than function first weapons. So to me, I like working on the stuff that is, that gets the time and the detail and uh, all this kind of thing. But in terms of what I'm focusing on now, it's, I'm, I'm more interested to continue making, making stuff for games. Um, and I feel like I've kind of, I've achieved the dream of working as a weapon artist and now I'm, I'm pretty open to what comes next. I have no real direction that I'm pushing myself in other than uh, kind of maybe being a bit more autonomous with my, my, my time and um, 
a bit more in control of my the way I spend it. Um, but yeah, in terms of the work stuff, whether I'm making props or weapons or gadgets, it's I feel like the the thing I got from weapon art is an obsessiveness over detail and an ability to know when it, a detail is important or not important. Um, okay. Yeah. So I think I learned a lot from making weapons, but I'm, um, and I would like to continue, but I don't really mind if I don't, <laughs> if that makes any sense. So you, you, you want to just make uh, things that are highly detailed and, um, yeah. yeah. I enjoy the flow state that I get into when making. So, okay. Because you can lose yourself in the details, right? Yeah, exactly. Like you can. I enjoy that state of being when you've been like, when you're looking at reference of a particular thing and then you're like, okay, well, I know it's made out of injection molded plastics. I'm going to add this seam line in here that I can't see on the reference, but it's the only plausible place that they would put this. And then, oh yeah, I'm going to just add this little uh, um, nozzle uh extrusion artifact where the injection moldy would you know like I, I enjoy playing around in in that space and if you're just if you're making stuff quickly and um without that thought uh mm -hmm. I, I, I you miss out on some of that fun stuff that i, I enjoy doing <laughs> so, yeah i'm pretty open this okay is so do you have any um, any uh, advice for ongoing weapon artists or hot surface artists? Like what is what were the most or the biggest mistakes you made in the beginning? Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um I'd say one of the first things to consider is that weapon art and in, as, a, as a thing, if we just take, take weapon art by itself, it, it is essentially like you can practice for weapon art by making anything. Um, Hannah Watts made this amazing um, mm -hmm. coffee machine, right? Now, from that, I know that if I gave her a bunch of references of a gun, she could without a doubt make it and incredibly, you know? And so anything that you look at and take to a high level of detail um, can be practiced for weapon art. It's essentially like being obsessive over these small details because these things are taking up a quarter of the screen in an FPS game. So that's significantly important. Um, so that's the first thing is just that like, it's not just about guns. <laughs> um, it's It's about like modeling skill, texturing skill, uh, understanding of function and how that plays into things. Always remembering that, you know, it has to be animated. So be aware of like the internals and you don't need to necessarily model everything, but modeling the right things comes into something I mentioned briefly earlier of, of like knowing when a detail is important and when it's not important. Um, that comes from a lot of experience. So that, that's a bit more tricky to just give advice on, but these things are things to, to practice and be, be conscious of. Um, I'm trying to think of the mistakes that I made. I think when I look back at some of the things I spent a lot of time trying to get things right and I think that's a good thing um, when I look at some of the things I made years ago um, like the, the taser was the first personal project kind of weapon that I made and that took probably longer than it should have done and when I look back at it I'm still I'm still happy with the result because I, just, I took that time to get it right, to learn about the different edges you get on different materials um, and the way those edges read is, is important to, 
to learn about basically and and i've got a couple of blogs about these kind of things um but if you're if yeah if you're trying to get into weapon art um just be aware that it's pretty damn competitive <laughs> um and mm. um essentially it is mastery of prop art and then the focus on weapon stuff like that's get a, the way get that a good prop art first right it's it's not even first it's just understanding that they use the same uh the same skills and so if okay. you're like I, I see some people being like don't take an environment art, artist position if you don't want to be an environment artist i would say that remember that you don't need to get your dream job when you start in the industry like i'm i'm 6 years in working in games and for the past year and a bit i've been going through a bit of a burnout period where i don't know what i'm doing next like one month i don't want to work in games anymore next month uh like i'm realizing what it is and how i enjoy doing it the next month i'm like yeah i want to work here but i don't really i don't i don't know what's next and like that can be really tough so being aware that this is a career this isn't a sprint like if you want to be a weapon artist it doesn't need to be the first job you get is making guns it can be that mm. and and on top of that i am a better game developer because of my experience at dambuster where i was working as a environment artist weapon and vehicle artist bit of a character art uh, i did a lot of marketing art um and i i was the the young green guy so i was also really excited to get substance painter up and running in the the next project they worked on so i got really excited and probably looking back on it now messed up quite a bunch but you know like but i am a better game developer now because of those experiences as someone who is not saying no to things because it's not exactly what i wanted um because i was curious and interested like i worked with tech art quite a lot to try and make sure that i understood why things were done the way they were done and and everything like that so yeah like as a if you're looking to get into weapon art like it, just remember that it's a it's a career um and mm. A career doesn't need to be over in six years, five years. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, it's a marathon, not a not a sprint, right? Yeah, that's a good. Yeah, that's the that's the phrase that I should have been saying. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. No, All it's... right, kid. I'm I'm pretty happy that you have been my guest today, and I think uh, you brought a a lot of value um in on the show, and I will. I will put all your information in the in the info box in the info box like your art station, like your blog, and and cool. so on. Or is there anything else? You can... uh, no. that's that that's good. Like okay. uh, the the blog, I, yeah. I worked quite hard on making a few blog posts, and yeah, uh, yeah, I saw it. Uh, I think there is some some information in there that I've already said, but um, I want to do more, but time. So mm -hmm. it's a marathon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. So thank you so much and thank you. Uh, take care. And you. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.